Greetings, friends, and welcome to episode 33 of the Dharma Junkie Podcast. I am your host, Justin Otto, and on this episode, I have author of Dive Manual, Anthony Tyler, and he's back on the podcast and actually in the studio today, which is quite a change because our last episode we did over Zoom. So this is quite a treat for me uh, to have him in the studio today. Uh, but he recently relocated from California to Florida, and uh, that was kind of fortuitous, and it gave us the ability to do this podcast. So we talk a lot about uh, morality, um, the nature of suffering, uh, the nature of good and evil, and it's, uh, it's a pretty good episode. I think you'll enjoy it. So please welcome Anthony Tyler. You might catch yourself sliding in and out of the You might catch yourself sliding in and out of the laboratory. Do, do, just relax and enjoy it. Do, just relax and enjoy it. This is an experiment, this is an experiment in, mind in mind formation. In formation. In formation. Forming, forming, controlling, controlling, operating your, operating mind, and your mind and your brain. We're using digital We're using techniques, digital techniques to, overload, to overload, scramble, scramble. scramble Confuse, confuse, unfocus, unfocus your, mind. your mind. The natural state of the brain is chaos. Chaos, chaos is beautiful. Is beautiful. Yeah, so anyway. But how the fuck you been, man? I've been all right, man. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm actually in Florida with you here in Pensacola. We're in the studio. I know. It's weird uh, doing an in-person podcast, isn't it? Yeah. How, yeah. How many of these have you done? Um, none. 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 No in-person podcast? No in-person These podcast. are my favorite, man, because yeah. we just get to sit here and actually like fucking chop it up and bullshit. Like, yeah. And it, it seems a little more personal than just trying to talk over fucking Zoom. I feel a little more professional. <laughs> <laughs> it's cool. It's cool. But uh, moving has been quite the transition. Um, I moved from the San Francisco area here to um, right outside like uh, Pensacola here in the Destin area and um, getting used to the uh, t- heavy, heavy rain and uh, hurricane action, but I don't have to get as used to it as uh, New Orleans does at this point. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's for sure. Mm. I, I, still, I don't think they're used to it yet. You know, yeah. They just, you know what's fucked up is uh, that hurricane hit last night, right? Mm. And that was the 16th year anniversary to the day of Hurricane Katrina. Boy. So 16 years later to the fucking day. All those preachers were right, man. It's God cursing everybody. No, I'm just I mean, joking. I mean, it might... Hey, maybe so. I mean, maybe it's cursing them for building a fucking city under sea level. I don't know. Uh, it yeah, seems like you, a poor idea to me. You know, yeah, the physics of that situation uh, don't really line up as well as they should. And not not so well. It's no. not seeming to pan out too well for them. No. Right. They probably should have put a little more forethought. Put yeah. More foresight into that. But, yeah, you know, it's a little late now. Yeah. I guess they just kind of damage control at this point. Hey, uh, God bless uh, anybody that's really put out by the situation. Um, yeah, I wish everybody in New Orleans nothing but the best, and uh, I hope you guys are okay. But, Girl. yeah, the infrastructure is absolutely ridiculous. Um, yeah, I mean, apparently, <laughs> like, from what I was reading on the news, like, apparently they're supposed to be out of power for, like, like the next at least month. At least a month, they're predicting. Wow. So, like, I don't know, you know, if there's any truth to that or not, but we'll, we'll see. I, I hope that they get power back sooner than that, because uh, otherwise they're really fucking – looking at a bad time i mean those people are not gonna be happy yeah i mean on the one hand i guess there's only so much preparation you can do given the amount of technology we have at our disposal but on the other hand it's like how i don't i don't know how how, how is there not more preparation or even it, preparation might not even be the right word but like the ability to withstand i don't know i don't know i don't know yeah, here, this is a uh, hurricane i don't know Hurricane Ida knocked out all eight transmission lines that deliver power to New Orleans, leaving the entire city without electricity as the powerful storm pushed through on Sunday and early Monday with winds that reached nearly 150 miles per hour. Yeah. Mm, Boy. So. Mm, Boy. All eight transmission lines that brought power in. So, yeah, they're looking at quite a while without power, I'm guessing. Mm, Yeah. It's it's, going to devolve into madness over there. And what I'm really concerned about is with there being this recent COVID spike. 
that they're saying is happening. Um, you know, there's already people that weren't able to get out of New Orleans. So now they're stuck in New Orleans. And anybody that's in a shelter, that's a really confined area, mm-hmm. you know. So they're going to be stuck in these shelters with this COVID spike going on and no power. Like, you know, it just seems like a recipe for fucking disaster. Christ. That is, a, <laughs> that is bleak. Yeah, My God. Yeah, it does not look uh, not look good for them. But you know, uh, they will they will push. Through. They got through Katrina, man. They're going to get through this too, and they'll, they'll be a stronger city for it, and they'll bounce back just like they did before. That's what they do. It's New Orleans. Yeah, I guess you have to be a, a certain breed of character to even want to stay in New Orleans, and I don't yeah. even mean that in a derogatory way. I'm sure it could, it goes no. derogatory, it goes both ways. But like, you got to be someone who's just either doesn't care or like feels comfortable you with that be, kind of I mean, shit. You got to be down. a pretty hardcore person to live yeah. in New Orleans. Just be. The culture there is just a, it's such a hard partying atmosphere. Like if you don't party in some way, like, I mean, I'm just sure there's people in New Orleans that don't, let's be realistic. There's gotta be, but man, seems like everybody there's just fucking drinking all the time or doing something. I know when I lived there, like I, that was probably, that was right before I went to rehab the first time. <laughs> and so if that tells you anything, <laughs> I feel but, that. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's an interesting city. Uh, You'll have to go. You'll have to go. I mean, obviously not anytime soon. Mm. Not within the next eight weeks, I'd say. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think not. that'd be a good time to go. I but, really uh, want to check out the murder museum, though. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the uh, um, yeah, the Museum of Death. That's what it is, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's pretty cool. There's some pretty cool tours over there, too. There's a lot of good history over there. I mean, New Orleans has you know, got a lot of fucked up history. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. I really respect um, uh, the kind of guerrilla warfare grassroots mentality of uh of, of voodoo and hoodoo i don't even know enough of the distinction but i know that there's slight variation but i mean it's all under the same umbrella of that that uh tribal um a- like uh, Af- uh westernized african sort of uh tradition and right. it's a uh, uh it's been a while since i brushed up on it but i've read about it a lot in the past and See, the, the mentality is fascinating because yeah. it's it's something that is really, um, I mean, and I mean this in the greatest sense possible. It is a spirituality of the underdog because that's where it was developed. Like essentially, it's ground zero for um, the uh, of slave culture trying to of you know, like African religious culture in America. Yeah, yeah trying to uh, sustain the people, trying to sustain themselves through the most bleak, horrific. Part, so, some of the most bleak and horrific parts of their history. So, yeah. I mean, it's a really fascinating spiritual practice, but it get, it, it, there's all sorts of um, weird rabbit holes that uh, New Orleans especially seems to take it down. Yeah, that's one of those things that's always kind of fascinated me, but I've never really done any research on. You know, I've never really looked into voodoo or hoodoo or done any like real, you know, boots on the ground kind of like research other than living in New Orleans, you know, like. And just what I was exposed to while I was there. But, yeah. But i um, pretty sure I wasn't exposed to much voodoo or hoodoo. Yeah. I mean, I can't say I know the inner workings or anything, but having studied a little bit of the history and the progression and the the uh, the, the historical implications, right. it's very interesting. Well, it seems to me like, it, you know, that stuff is very uh, existent there. It's, it is it is very prevalent, but it's also still very underground. Like, yeah. I mean, all the authentic stuff is. You know, yeah. All that stuff's pretty very. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So how was your drive over, man? Um, it was. If, it, it was how long did cool. it take you? Uh, First of all. It was four days. Um, so we did it pretty quick. My sister and I drove like nine or 10 hours a day. I drove. Um, I, she offered to drive, but I was just kind of feeling the energy of the road, man. Once you start putting enough miles behind you, it Dude, starts I, to, I set a, yeah, you feel it. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's yeah. kind of, it's similar to like a runner's high almost. Uh, Cause you are, Absolutely. especially you get deep enough into it. You're, you're exerting yourself in different sort of ways. So yeah. it was fun. You know, some of the, see, we went to, um, I uh, went to Cadillac Ranch. A lot of people know that. If you don't, it's that place out in uh, Amarillo, Texas, where they got the it's like ten or so Cadillacs nose dived into the ground, and right. uh, I spray painted my book title on there. Nice. Uh, so that was pretty fun. I'm sure it didn't last very long, but I still got a picture with it. The first book or the one you're working on now? Uh, dive manual. Dive manual. Yeah, yeah and cool. then um, I did a lot of work on this uh, this new upcoming release, Hunt Manual, before I left, and actually after I got here. Um, and I got that in the hands of the editor, good old Martin Ferretti now, the Alchemical Mind podcast. So, nice, nice. um, 
That's a good man to have as your editor. I, I would agree. Yeah, uh, Martin's a, a fun guy, and he's uh, he's as intelligent as he is conversational. Yeah, I love Martin. I wish I wish that I would have had the opportunity to talk to Martin more. I'm gonna have to reach out to him and uh, touch base with him. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. He's it's, been, it's been a while since I since I've talked to him, like quite a while, and uh, I feel like I, I really should reach out to him because yeah. I love him. He's he's such a good dude. He is. He's yeah. just, I mean, just a really stand up guy, you know, mm-hmm. and, and super knowledgeable. Mm-hmm. And like really does his research. Like yeah, when he absolutely. when he does a fucking podcast, he does a fucking podcast. Like that shit blows me away. I'm like, God damn, man, how much time did you put into this? <laughs> yeah. I know how much time I put into mine, and I just sit here and bullshit for the most part. <laughs> but, but, so like pretty uneventful though, or um I mean I noticed that you uh we were talking about it on the on the way back over here before we started uh talking. Uh you had to take your your grill off of your car. Yeah, man. You wanna you wanna talk about that? Why you had to do that? Um well, I just some basic. I mean, um, uh, what is it called? The uh, it's a the it's some sort of sensor in there, and um, um, I needed more airflow when I was going through the friggin' uh, Mojave. It was pretty hot. Uh, it was scorching, and uh, the car was over. It, it's doing this thing where it was it was glitching out the sensor. The car wasn't overheating, but it was telling itself that it was overheating. So I had to get maximum airflow into that hood um so I, I, that was uh that was dicey for a second but um it panned out and it worked out just fine after that that's good man yeah i'm glad, I'm glad you got here fairly uh you know fairly unscathed yeah just, and, um, just a few minor minor hitches man i can't remember the name of this place because f- full disclosure i there's only so much time i can invest into tv shows even though i i respect them uh, and their cultural significance. So like, I never got into Breaking Bad, but, uh, my sister did. And we stopped by the, uh, with the dog house or whatever, the, the classic hot dog shack that's always seen in Breaking Bad and got pictures there. Oh, okay. So that was, you know, just little, little tourist stuff. Um, there's some other stuff, but you know, um, I went and got a picture with the quote unquote second amendment cowboy in Texas. <laughs> Second Amendment cowboy. I don't think I've heard of him. It's just a giant, giant cowboy. And it he just has the word Second Amendment on his chest. It's pr- kind of uneventful, but <laughs> it, it was on the way. Right. So, um, but, uh, yeah, so here in Florida and, um, I don't know, Florida's been, I yeah, like it. How, how are you enjoying Florida thus far? I like it, man. Um, I, t- I told you it's co- fucking completely different than California. Mm-hmm. Like it's like the polar opposite of California. Let's well, see. Pros, yeah. It's the other sunshine state. Mm-hmm. Pros and cons to every state. Um, it's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not conservative or, uh, liberal particularly, but, uh, it, it, I, it, California compared to Florida is definitely, I'm just not doing that. I've been making background noise with that clicking for a second. Um, <laughs> I, uh, uh, the, the differences between, uh, both the states, uh, I mean, they couldn't be more polar opposites politically, but, um, um, and I hate both, uh, both extremes to a passion, but, you know, in Florida overall, it, it's gotten to the point, and I hate to talk politics, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I can. I sure can. I could come out swinging, but, um, I, I, I appreciate the, um, I don't know, just the fact that there is some, um, autonomy left to the individual in Florida. And I mean, some right. people will, will shit on that one way or the other. Uh, but hey, uh, I mean, <laughs> this, the, we, we do have to maintain a certain amount of autonomy. It's not just like, well, we're in America. It's more of just a, a, a humanistic approach to things. I feel like, right. you know, I think that also you should be taking precaution with, uh, with the things going on around us, the COVID and everything else. But you also, um, some of that should be, upon your own conscience instead of being mandated and right you know i mean to, to be honest with you i can't believe let's, fuck it let's get into it a little bit i can't believe that people uh expected anything less than this uh, complete um split down the middle of people pro and for precaution whether it be mass or vaccination like, that's how it's always been on every subject that people <laughs> yeah, act I was about like to say, like right first now. of all that's the way it's always been yeah, yeah. how is and, it and second how could you get away from it with the media fucking polarizing it the way they are yeah God. you know what i'm saying like yeah, within the hyping it up the way that they are and, and dividing people one way or the other it's just ridiculous man and there's so much false fucking stick. information out there. No. Yeah. You know, on both sides of the fence, there's just tons of false information. And it's very confusing. It's very confusing for the average individual. 
Yeah. It's, you know, it, it's confusing for, for even it, man. I don't know who it's not confusing for unless they're at the tippy top making the calls. That's what I'm saying yeah. for the average individual. Though, I guess for, we're you all know, for average a fucking in that Joe, sense, Joe yeah. citizen. Yeah, it's, mm-hmm. you know, like there's so much on one, you know, fucking on one side, and then there's you know the other side. And everybody's, you know, you're you got uh, the one I, I love lately is like uh, you're. If you, you know, you're against getting vaccinated, then somehow you're some sort of white supremacist or something. <laughs> like I've heard that one. Like, uh, like that's so insane. That's how I don't even see how you reach that correlation. I guess, you know, because like a, it's a lot of the people on the far right that are, you know, like anti mask and like, you know, COVID's a lie and all that shit. Right. Yeah. So I, I assume that they're tying those two things together there. Like, because if you're far right, then you're probably more likely to be a white supremacist than if you're, you know, far left. I don't think there's really too many far left white supremacists. I think that's fair to say. <laughs> um, but yeah. I, I, people like usual are making broad strokes and, uh, I also like usual, it seems like people are looking for excuses to dehumanize one another. Um, you know, oh man, absolutely. You ever, uh, you ever just pay attention to the comments and like on literally anything, you can go to the fucking marketplace on Facebook and people are just trashing each other left and right over shit for sale. Like, I can't even believe you're fucking selling that, you piece of shit. Like, <laughs> like, god damn, like, ouch. Like there's, you literally can't do fucking anything without somebody shitting on you anymore, and it's amazing. Mm-hmm. It's it's just astounding to me. Like, is have we d- devolved that far that you can't even fucking post something for fucking sale without getting trashed over it? Now, granted, some of these people deserve it because they're posting some outlandish shit for sale, like or rooms for rent for like five hundred dollars a week. Oh my, a room, yeah, in wow. somebody's house for five hundred dollars a week. Like, first of all. You're talking about two thousand dollars a month. I'm pretty sure you can get a fucking house for that, even in this fucking market. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. yeah, you can. So, I, and that's definitely a mortgage. Mm-hmm. So uh, that's crazy. So yeah, trash that person. But like you know, other things like somebody posted a car for sale, and oh, maybe there's you know a minor issue with it. Like, and they they actually say that okay, you know, it has this wrong with it, and they're like, oh, you fucking said got the fucking car for sale. <laughs> fucking Jesus Christ. Y'all calm the fuck down, please. Can we all just get along? Life sucks enough without us fucking being at each other's throats all the time. Mm-hmm. Like, God damn. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't, the time, um, nuance seems to be, um, too much for some people because you have people looking for safe spaces and then you have people looking to, um, make a battleground out of every commonplace situation. And, um, you can't do one or the other too much. I mean, it's the damn middle path. That's the, yeah, it goes right back to the middle path. <laughs> yeah, man, it's always the middle path. The Buddhists path. had it right. Yeah, yes, the, they the did. The middle path. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That shit's crazy to me, though, man. Like, and, and you're right. You can't, one way or the other, there's people that are, you know, just like you said, there's people that are looking for a safe space, which I think is absolutely fucking ridiculous as well. And, mm-hmm. But then, uh, just as, if not more ridiculous, absolutely more ridiculous, are the people that are constantly trying to start a fight over nothing yeah i mean let's be real that's worse it It is worse it's absolutely worse than somebody just looking for sanctuary Mm -hmm. yeah um i mean it's hard it's shit it's hard even for me man it's hard for everybody um because i'm certainly not special i'm just saying i'm i'm not even talking about this from a from like a sociological like this is very personal as well you know it's hard to find um that discretion you know, in uh, in times, so you know, some people uh, don't have any sort of self reflection, and um, if you just take any certain steps towards that, you'll find that you can, you know, uh, you, it's a lot easier to work on yourself because you can't work on yourself without self reflection. But then there's people who are plenty self reflective that, you know, once you get caught up in the moment, it's it's not even like you, uh, you know, even for me, I can um, fully acknowledge when I'm getting. Um, very anxious or something because I still deal with uh right. with anxiety. It's like m- the clinical anxiety sometimes, yeah. and um, um, the only reason I don't deal with it all the time is because I have certain um habits and things in my life and uh, coping mechanisms, if you will. But um, you know, you can feel yourself get ramped up, and you can understand it, and you can be very self aware of it from that sort of like Buddhist perspective. But you, 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 
you don't always have a uh, control over things. And in some sense, it's a, it's a matter of, um, uh, reining it in, you know, and then just being observant of it, you know, because you can't, you can't squash it. I mean, it's part of being human as well. I think it's, well, it's absolutely part of being human. And that's, I think the whole point of Buddhism is like, you know, that's part of, that is part of human nature is like, yeah, in life, there's going to be times where there's suffering and you're going to get caught up in your thoughts. And there's, you know, what they call in Buddhism in the Pali Canon, there's the five hindrances that's a uh, craving, um, aversion, uh, lethargy, restlessness and doubt, right? And those things are going to creep in. And the point of the reflection, the meditative practice is to, to kind of hone in your skills to notice when that's happening and, and bring you back to center. You know what I'm saying? So you like, you note it happening and then you're like, okay. And you kind of take a breath and kind of, you know, remain mindful. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, use these things as like bells of mindfulness. Mm -hmm. It's uh, what, um, yeah. Claude Anshin Thomas calls it a, a bell of mindfulness. And That's you can find different bells of mindfulness throughout the day. Like when you're at a stoplight, like if you go to a stoplight, that's a, can be a bell of mindfulness for you. It's kind of like, um, so you just a you kick know, in the uh, levels of the dream and inception. Right. Yeah. Right. So, you know, you use that stoplight as your, your bell of mindfulness to just take a moment and kind of find your center again. But yeah, I mean, even, I think it takes years of practice. I think it takes years and years of practice mm -hmm. of doing that to not be able to lose it. You know, I think that humans naturally have a tendency to be all over the place. Mm -hmm. We have shitty programming, mm -hmm. but um, fortunately we can change that programming. I just think it takes a while for it to really click in. Cause I sit twice a day. I sit in the morning and I sit at night, you know, and I have a pretty dedicated meditation practice and have for a while. Um, even, even when I was in active addiction, when I relapsed, like I still had a, was still maintaining somewhat of a meditation practice. It wasn't the greatest, but I was still doing it. Mm -hmm. And I was very mindful of the fact that I was fucking up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I could watch myself doing it and still, you know, addiction is such a, a monster that, you know, even watching yourself do it, you can't really control it at times. But hungry ghosts, man. Yeah, man. Hungry ghosts, the Prado realm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's big, how I big feel stomachs with my and small too. mouths, man. Big yeah. stomachs and small mouths. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, it's, I've, it, you know, part of being in Florida, um, uh, just circumstantially and a conscious decision I made, um, you know, a, a combination of both and rolling into circumstances consciously, I guess you could say I've, uh, been sobering up a lot more. And, uh, so I've always used, uh, cannabis in a variety of, actually medicinal ways to, to deal with a uh, certain chronic pain I have, right. and, but also definitely using it for self-medicating in right. ways that were probably uh, definitely limiting at times. Right. And, um, you know, it's been uh, one part of the journey, finding the difference between the two, the actual therapeutic value versus right. the just addiction, the, right. the psychological, because it's, 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 you know, addiction, it tends to, people usually tend to think of, um, um, like it's not even like I would spiral out if I didn't have it. It's more like I didn't, it's just, I didn't of, feel comfortable with myself. Right. It's one of those things that you just, the, you, exactly. If you don't feel comfortable or, you know, you're in a situation where you, you don't feel comfortable then you like, you go for that because you know, that's going right. to help you feel comfortable. That's exactly. And yeah. what you really have to do is just be uncomfortable. But and that's all the yeah, whole point of the, learning, that's the whole yeah. point of the meditation practice is like, that's why they say, you know, sit upright. You know, with your spine erect, it's in, and, and, you know, you don't move for X amount of time. You know, I've sat for up to an hour at a time, um, without fucking moving. Like if my face itches, I don't scratch it. You know, I just mm -hmm. sit and I just fucking go back to the breath and I just fucking let it go. And I, and that's the whole point is like learning to be comfortable with being uncomfortable right. because you're not going to be able to work through those things if you don't just sit through them like if you're always reaching for weed or whatever a drink or whatever your your poison happens to be cannabis for you mm -hmm. but uh, if you're always reaching for that then you're never going to be comfortable really in your own skin because you've never given yourself the opportunity to learn to be comfortable in your own skin right yeah that's exactly it and um you know being uh sober more sober um certainly not entirely but uh drastically more sober it's a uh, um, you know, and then on top of moving to a completely new place, um, it's given me a lot of time for pause and, um, self-reflection and, um, you know, the ways that like it talking about being 
comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, I, I've realized that oftentimes this is something I've had on the tip of my tongue mentally for a while, but I've only been able to articulate it now really. And sometimes, you know, it feels like the better path would be to be level headed, but level headed is a very slippery slope because I mean, there's a very, first of all, let's define level headed. Exactly. What, what do you mean by level headed? Well, who, who the fuck knows what anybody <laughs> means by level headed? Because I, I thought it was a pretty straightforward thing at first. Um, but because you think just like calm, cool, calm and collected, but what are those components when you break them down? And for me, what that's boiled down to is, um, actually um suppressing some of the things that i should have been more open about uh do you think it's suppression or do you think it's a reduction in reactivity because i would like to think that level being level-headed is just reducing your reactivity i think it's stressful situations i think it's that at a best case scenario and i think what it's been for me um sometimes to a detriment has been when when trying to be um, uh, reductive in my reaction. I have actually suppressed things instead of whoops. And yeah, it's all good. <laughs> in trying to be reductive to my reaction, I've actually su- suppressed things instead, uh, and, and haven't fully realized it. And then you just kind of let things build. And, um, and a lot of times you don't communicate properly. Like, you know, I, part of the self reflection is, um, you know, I left, uh, the longest relationship I had back in California and, um, you know, I, it was something that I had to do, but I didn't feel good about it. And, um, I, uh, I left so quickly that I didn't really have time to think about it much. And it was still the right, it, it was necessary for, for both of us, but, um, you know, getting here and, uh, and, and finally having a moment to, uh, to myself is when it really kind of comes to you. And, uh, and then you, in sobriety as well, it, it, it becomes especially clear and, you know, you got to be comfortable with being uncomfortable sometimes. Right. That's exactly it. And, uh, that's been my life in the moment because, you know, I'm pretty satisfied with my move and I really, things just, um, things didn't collapse in California for me at all, but it was just, I was starting to notice that I was spinning my wheels. You know, aside from the art, you know, the book and the podcast, all that was uh, even more fruitful than I would have expected it to be. I'm very thankful and grateful. But uh, everything else was just I was just uh, really spinning my wheels in California. And um, as I think most of the average person is in California at this point. Right. Um, and so anyway, um, I uh, can't have your cake and eat it, too, man. I, I miss her, though. So, but it's one of those things where, um, it, it, it's not the only thing, but it's one of, it was a pivot for me. It's been a pivot for me thus far where I've, um, I've learned, I've, I don't know, I've gotten, um, my head around the situation more in terms of what their, what the difference is between being level headed and then just suppressing yourself. Right. Well, there's, there's stifling your emotions and then there's being okay with your emotions. Man, this, I mean, this goes back to the Craigslist conversation with people tearing people apart on uh, Facebook, um, Market sales and yeah, stuff. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, um, I mean, at, at its core, some people are insane, but at its core, like it's, it's very hard to find that line between, um, what is even, you know, even if you're trying to um, do the right thing, like, I don't know, it's, you know, <clears throat> well, there's, yeah, there, there's this thing like the four rules for speech, you know, about the four rules for speech, like, there's like four facets to a, if you're going to make a statement, you need to make sure it hits on hopefully all of these, mm-hmm. or at least one of them. Is it true? Is it helpful? Is it kind? And is it timely? And if it's none of those fucking things, if you can't hit at least one of those, then you probably shouldn't fucking say it. You know what I'm saying? So like, Mm -hmm. if it's not true, if it's not kind, if it's not helpful, or if it's not timely for this, this situation at hand, then, you know, what's the point? So all these people just, you know, 
taking it upon themselves to just shit on other people because they have nothing better to do because their fucking life sucks so bad that that's their form of entertainment. I feel really sorry for those people. Mm-hmm. You know, like if that's well, you're if taking that's, it to a level of entertainment. It's a whole different story, right? If that's yeah. your form of entertainment, like you, you're, you're a piece of shit. You probably need some therapy or something. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. Need, you got some shit you need to work through. Yeah, I mean everybody's human, but that is a piece of shit type of mentality. It's just I don't, why? don't mean to dehumanize or anything. I mean, but you know, why do that? And why take it to that level? It's yeah. so unneeded. It's just unnecessary. Yeah. Um, well, but I, I think you did a good thing by moving. I mean, I know it was a, uh, definitely an emotional thing for you, you know, leaving her behind and making that decision. And you did make it very quickly. Cause I know like you, texted me and you're like i'm thinking about moving to florida and i was like i can do it and like, like a few days later it's and like, it was right. like it was like two weeks you're like yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm like i'm on my way like oh yeah shit. yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, um that's right that's right um and uh i mean i'm much closer to family here i didn't have any family in california so that's good but um there's a quote that's stuck in my mind a lot. I certainly won't be able to remember it all, but I can, I can paraphrase it well. And it's in a, um, um, a Philip K. Dick interview that was done in his like living room. So it's very podcast ish, but it's like from the seventies. Mm. And, um, uh, you can find it on YouTube. Um, I don't know what it's called. It's like rare Philip K. Dick interview and it, it, you'll know it when you find it. Um, it's like one of the first ones. And, uh, uh, he talks about and he relates it to, this whole Buddhist notion and in ways also this Gnostic sort of notion um, where he has to kill this rat that he finds in his house and uh, because it already ate the poison, right. but it didn't die. So he goes through a series of ways that where he's really in earnest, just trying to put this rat out of its misery. He's, um, he's, um, you know, uh, stabbing it with a pitchfork and there's like a, f- a few other things where the rat is just, just a, a living corpse at this point. It's all like mutilated, right. but he, he's trying to find a way to kill it. And mm-hmm. in a sense, failing at putting this rat effectively out of its misery, Philip K. Dick is genuinely experiencing some level of torture and torment existentially because he right. is not comfortable with the situation on any level. And, uh, and, uh, being such an empathetic person that he was, um, you know, immediately like that, uh, I don't know if anybody, if anybody watches always sunny in Philadelphia, I always, I I always think, show. yeah, Charlie's like, I'm trapped like a rat. I'm trapped, <laughs> trapped like a rat. <laughs> <laughs> I've been, that's been going through my head a lot lately. And in the end, Philip K. Dick has to kill this rat and he finally does. And he ends up burying a St. Christopher medal with that rat. And, oh, wow. and he talks, and he's recounting the story like 20 years later or something. And he even puts the spirit of that rat as a small, small side character in one of his books. I can't remember what it is, but he says, from that point on, I, w- I came face to face in a way that I never fully had with, you know, not just human suffering, but the, the emotional extents of, a variety of um of just suffering. Of suffering at large yeah. yeah the grandest scheme and uh and the 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 real takeaway uh just and it 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 i there there aren't any clear answers to it but it really comes back to being comfortable with being uncomfortable in a way and also, I feel like the serenity prayer, you know, being able to right. uh, change what you can't, the, 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 the strength, things you cannot change. Yeah. And Courage, the wisdom. Change the things that you can. And the wisdom to know the difference. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And um, yeah. It, because in that moment, you know, as much as he wanted to put that rat out of its misery, all he did was prolong it. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, that, that's life, man. Yeah. Life is suffering. And there's, you know, there's sickness aging and death and those are inescapable suffering you know those are the things that we're always going to be exposed to you know forever Mm -hmm. you're never going to escape sickness aging and death Mm -hmm. those are three caveats of life but like other than that like really the only things that cause suffering in my opinion are like not getting something you want getting something you don't want or losing something you've already got. Mm, yeah. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Other than like outside of sickness, aging and death, those are the three things that cause suffering. Mm-hmm. You know, just getting, not getting something you do want, 
getting something you don't want, like fucking cancer or, well, I mean, that would be sickness, but you know, like say uh, you're wrecking your car or losing something you've got, that would be wrecking your car. You know what I'm saying? Like things like that loss, basically loss or not gaining, you know, that craving thing the Buddhists talk about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, yeah, I, I think it's important to note too that desire and craving are two different fucking things. Like you can have desire, and it's important to have goals and aspirations. Like, and that was a big thing that fucked me up for a while with Buddhism was like, if I'm not supposed to like crave things or desire things, like how do I progress in my life if I don't have, you know, goals and aspirations? It's like, no, you get to have goals and aspirations, but it's the journey to the goal. You know, Peterson talks about this all the time. Mm -hmm. It's not the the end point, that's, you know, fuck, the end of the journey. That's, you know, getting, once you graduate, then, then what? You know, like the journey is over. It's the journey itself that's meaningful. And that's how you create meaning in life is the journey. It's not the destination. But. Amen, man. Amen. I, uh, but, you know, things have, um, I've been, um, uh, I've been really satisfied with, uh, with the steps that I've personally taken. And, um, I, uh, I, 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 I didn't talk to that girl until I, uh, I got to Florida and then, um, I, I, I tried to see what kind of magic I could work, but like I said, you can't have your cake and eat it too. And, uh, yeah, that's about as much as I expected. But, um, um, I, I also, you know, it's, it's real trade trade-offs in life because as much as I miss her and I'm somber about it, I don't mean to sound crass, but. I, I mean, I have, uh, some very serious passions and aspirations and, um, there was some heavy stuff going on, uh, circumstantially in the relationship that we didn't really have control over. And, um, um, I would have, it would have been a completely different veer for my life and I wouldn't have fucking finished this book for a long time. Right. So, I mean, that's not the only thing. It's not woman or book but right those are aspects to it and now i got this book done and um you know moving forward with some other projects um, a handful of different things uh coming down the pipe so that's good um but you know we were talking last time where i was just chilling with you and um we we're talking about good and evil and yeah. you know this really ties into uh concepts of suffering and um you know because you do need to be comfortable with being uncomfortable, but also there are those times when you need to revolt, right? And then, right. and you need to stand up for yourself and stand up for others against things that are very genuinely evil. And well, yeah, inaction is still action. Right. Well said. Yeah. Um, and uh, th that this is a lot of, um, um, that line between that acceptance and that, um, unnecessary, like self victimization, uh, allowing yourself to be victimized, essentially. Um, it's, um, it's definitely a, one of the strongest re recurring themes in Hunt Manual, the book I got coming out. Um, and, um, you know, let's get into that a little more because it's, Absolutely. It, it, you know, it, one of the easiest takeaways I've found to open up th that whole dichotomy, um, is, and it's really hard to find the line sometimes, um, even for an adept person. Um, the, the difference between, uh, like genuine self-righteousness and genuine predatory nature. Um, it, because once you get to the, a certain level of self-righteousness, you, I, it, it, there's this continuum where you tip over into predatory nature, whether you decide consciously or not. You know, and be, because at a certain point, you know, like the easiest example being, um, you know, in, in America, you see it with conservatives the most, but it's not just, uh, white Christians by any means. Um, it, you can see it all throughout history. This idea of praying for, uh, the people suffering on our side and, and, uh, you know, damning to hell and back the enemy. And, um, I mean, you see that a lot with the left now too. Yeah, yeah, it's true. You sure do. Yeah. I mean, I think you see it more with the far left than you do with the far right right now. You might be right. No pun intended. Um, <laughs> but, Come on, uh, man. I'm pretty middle of the road. I'm fiscally conservative. Likewise. Um, but, 
with um yeah so it, it seems so often especially in uh, uh today you know unless you get the really sadistic people like the where so much evil comes from in the human being because evil d- exists primarily or uh it it uh stems from the human being um is that people you, you know it's, it's also an overreaction right i have a question what do you think it stems from because um, we kind of talked about this the last time we hung out when yeah. we were talking about the nature of evil and like if there's a way to quantify evil itself and uh, we we got to some pretty good solutions for it and i think you know it's like i was saying before i think it's fear first of all and it's it's survival i think when people get into that survival mode when it's that fight or flight you know that's when people become awful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, um, and see, that is a part of, um, that's probably the greatest, uh, bridge to gap for, uh, just the human being in general is how to maintain humanity when all humanity is lost around you. And, um, because that's when most people throw in the towel and just give into it. Right. But on the other hand, again, there is that, that that weird threshold where you you see and you over you try to overcorrect and overreact where you see injustice done and then you go so hard against that injustice that you just become i mean it's it's the entire premise of the book not the movie the book i am legend right that's 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 it's in the title right there it's um robert neville was hunting the vampires because he was alone and drinking himself to death and it, you know, just waiting to die and, uh, and, and just, just so angry that everything had been taken from him that he was just going door to door, staking vampires. Right. And in the end, you know, I, I don't give a shit about your spoiler alerts. Anybody out there, it's, you've had long enough to read the book. You can skip ahead a second if you want. <laughs> but it, it, in the end, all I'll say is, he realizes that he's he's the one that's been the monster the whole time because the evolutionary curve has changed. Right. You know, he is the monster. He is the legend, the vampire legend now. Right. He's the the monster that was going around door to door and um you know, it's it's kind of the same thing as the whole Philip K Dick and the rat and yeah. and you know, it, so do you does a good is a can a good person be evil? There's a question. I think I so. I think anybody can be evil. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that, I think everybody has the capacity for evil. But can you be simultaneously both? Can you be the antinomy? I mean, I think I think we've seen that play out several times. I think every time that there's any type of war fought over religion, somebody feels like they're. But can you genuinely be both and not just lie to yourself? Yeah, yeah, for sure. If you genuinely feel like you are killing in the name of the lord and you have this righteous retribution that you're paying and like then yeah i think so i think you can be both i think yeah i think there's some you know probably some delusion involved but i think i think it's a a really thin line to walk you know like at what point does divine retribution become you know heinous you know and and even if you're doing it, you know, in the name of good, per se, you know, I mean, the no no religious war was ever fought because people thought they were wrong. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's a funny joke. Right you know there, what I'm yeah. saying? Like, let's be realistic. Yeah. Like, they, they all thought they were doing what God intended them to do. This is what we're supposed to do. Mm-hmm. Protect our people because we're the one. And it's all, it all goes back to, you know, when we were talking the other day, it's, I think, you know, like I said, it all comes down to fear. And then I think it all comes down to ego. And in at least my perspective, ego is nothing more than the illusion of separateness. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like the ego, the sense of I, you know, the sense of self, like that comes with feeling like you're, you're separate from the world. You know what I mean? Like you're exper- you know, because you are experiencing the world subjectively yourself. Like you see the world as outside of yourself, but we're really all just connected. We're all the same fucking person living life under different causes and conditions subjectively. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? We're all experiencing life 
in the same manner. Like you or me under a different set of causes and conditions, you know what I mean? And that's Absolutely. the way I try to view people is like, everybody's just me living a different life. Even that chick at the store that was real mad at me for pulling in that parking spot. Yeah. That's yeah. a, she, uh, yeah, she was very mad at you for using a completely legal parking spot. I just, yeah, I'm <laughs> astounding. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, there, but for the flap of a butterfly wing, go I. Yep. Yep. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, it's just uh, different causes and conditions and, Who's to say what's right or wrong? Like then I think, you know, that's totally subjective. So you really to categorize evil, uh, you have to like look at morality and morality is entirely subjective. Now, I think that harming somebody or not even somebody, but just the harming beings is uh, essentially evil. You know, I think that's evil. Was Philip K. Dick evil in that situation? <sighs> It's a tough one. Well, you, I mean, if the rat was already poisoned, then no. But he could have just let the poison take its effect because ultimately he did more more harm than good. You know, there's a. It's a really tough question. I feel like. Yeah, yeah, it is a tough question. You know, because I mean, obviously, it. You know, to, uh, all respect due to the rat, and, and not jokingly either. Um, um, it is a rat, and, but I mean, it's a very poignant, useful. Um, because it's it's relevant it's another life and it extends you know it's something it's it's a common denominator that can extend to over like any well, given situation because well, I mean, it's suffering at large well you know look at look at the rats they use for testing right exactly you know, they're, yeah. they're starved yeah, it's, it's disturbing 70, if, you, 75 if you really want to think about weight, it you know enough. like skinner's rats they were mm -hmm. starved to 75 percent of their body weight they were held in isolation but that's a pretty good model for a rat and a rat's a pretty good model for a human so, I used to say, mm -hmm. you know. trap like a rat, man. Trap like a rat. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, that's really poignant because I think you're right about um, even if there's a small level of like delusion um, on a on a on a real level, on like an authentic level, you could certainly be good and evil, and you could certainly be right and wrong. Um, it, it, because you know uh evil aside you know I, I definitely i feel like i was right and wrong in uh like with this past relationship and plenty of things and, i feel uh, like i'm right and wrong in my present relationship yeah you know like, i mean yeah, that's just life yeah yeah I, I don't like that feeling but i'm getting more used to it <laughs> gotta be on gotta be comfortable with being uncomfortable man yeah i yeah I, <laughs> you know i am comfortable with the gray areas but i like to sift through the gray areas and um there's a there's a lot of gray areas that i'm comfortable letting go but i guess when it comes to something as um like intrinsic to your personality and psyche as romance it's it's still hard it, you know you gotta deal you gotta uh learn to deal with the gray areas yeah yeah i i endeavor to be a better partner you know i'm, I'm, I'm pretty good some of the time I'm not going to say most of the time because that would be a fucking lie. I'm probably a, a shitty boyfriend most of the time. And I, as much as I try to be a good one, you know, like I, I still have my faults. And, and the, the weird thing is, especially having a meditation that. practice and really having that time for self reflection that I give myself and like being able to look inward, like I see all my faults and I know they're there. But like we were talking about earlier, it doesn't make it any easier to fucking stop doing them. You know, like right. even being cognizant of them doesn't make me any less apt to fucking do them most of the time, which is fucked up because I can watch myself behaving in this manner right. and still not fucking do anything about it. It's ridiculous. Talk about existential horror. It is the, entirely existential it. horror because I yeah. watch myself be a piece of shit a lot and not just in my relationships, but just... In, in the way I interact with other people sometimes, like, and it's, it's not near as bad as it used to be because I am cognizant of it, but I still can see myself doing little things that I'm like, oh, I gotta I'm work in the on same that. boat. Yeah. I gotta work on that, you yeah. know, like, and I say a piece of shit, and that's probably a, a pretty broad overstatement. Like, <laughs> I'm probably not a piece of shit. Some things for sure I'm a piece of shit about, but other things not so much, and I'm just too hard on myself, I think. Well, yeah, there's a huge difference I think between I, messing up and being a piece of shit. Yeah. So, well, I, I mean, I, I think I have a, I think I set the bar very high for myself and then, um, uh, I'm not always able to attain that. 
And then that brings me back to yet more existential horror, you mm-hmm. know, because like I, I do want to be a good person and I do want to be a fucking good friend and a good partner to my, my girlfriend. And I do want to be a good you know father figure to her kids. And I do want to be all these things, but I also want to host a fucking podcast and I also want to go to school and I also want to work and I also have all these goals and aspirations and I'm about to start working on a book and I have all these things going on and it's like, trying to split my time between all of them and then like maintain my sanity while doing so. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I just get overwhelmed and Mm -hmm. I, and and then I, I I fucking like snap and like, I'll be real short with people. I'm like, no, you know, I'm kind of a dick and like, and I can see myself behaving in that manner. And Mm -hmm. it's like, and a lot of the time I think I feel justified for doing it and I'm not, I'm really not justified for doing it. Like I still don't have to really are we treat other people in that manner and be so short with them and be so curt. Um, but I still do it and I'm trying to break myself of it. I'm trying to use those bells of mindfulness to, mm-hmm. to stop doing that. But it's hard. It's yeah. hard. Even with a fucking dedicated practice, I, you know, I still get angry. I still get frustrated. And I, I don't think that's anything that's going to go away anytime soon. It's just, you know, it's in, with the Buddhism thing, man, like studying the Dharma, like I've been doing like pretty heavy, for a while now is it's like, you're, you're never going to get rid of the suffering. The suffering's always going to be there. And, you know, it's like I said earlier, you're just going to change your reactivity to it. You know, you're just not going to let things bother you. So much. it's not that they're not going to bother you. You're just not going to, you get to choose how much they bother you. Yeah. You get to choose and you get to choose whether or not that becomes a catalyst for something beautiful or destructive. Um, right. And, uh, you know, cause that was something definitely not, so much with this relationship at all. Cause I, I've uh, been able to put this lesson into practice um, pretty thoroughly. I feel like, but certainly in the past I was really, um, I would get caught up in feeling like, why does this person take up any sort of mental space? Why can't I just, you know, it's, I hate to use the, the, the truth, the trope at this point, but it's, I love it. It's a great one. Uh, it, it really is that whole deleting of the aspects of the mind, like eternal sunshine, the spotless mind, like what, you know, on a practical level, why can't I just turn this, this, this knob down more? And I mean, and, and, and you do and so and part of that is time and growing up, but on some level, you know, you carry just like Philip K. Dick with the rat, you carry those people right. on you. For the rest of your life. Yeah. I mean, you're going to carry that imprint forever. Yeah, forever. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's, it's certainly like that with romance, but it extends well beyond that. I mean, you know, it could extend I to mean, the rat and yeah, the trap. It could extend to that lady at the store. Yeah. I'm probably going to remember that one for a while. Probably yeah. not forever, <laughs> but I'll remember it for a while. Uh-huh. She was super mad. <laughs> that was so funny. <laughs> I didn't do anything. I don't know. I what. legit just went to go get this energy drink. You'd think that you just ran over all her groceries or something. <laughs> I, man, I don't, I don't know what she had going on, but I, I, I wish her the best. Mm-hmm. I hope mm-hmm. she's going to be okay. I hope she works through whatever existential horror she's got going on right now. You know, because real talk, that's the shit that scares me, man. I can watch horror movies. I can listen to true crime podcasts about the worst people. And the shit that scares me is, you know, the the existential horror of being caught up in habits and cycles that you're aware of. Just as one example that you're aware of and can't get out of or like... You know, the, uh, the fucking feedback loop, the feedback loop, the, the, of suffering and how it's, it's, it's not, it's not that it's your fault, but it, there's, um, there are steps that you can take to mitigate and, and then catalyze it in positive ways or destructive ways. And people don't often, I mean, cause it's fucking hard, man. It's fucking hard to sit in the moment of suffering and decide, not only that you want to use it for something positive, but decide how you're going to use it for something positive. That's right. hard. You know, you know what else is hard is being, you know, a recovering addict is to not want to dull that feeling, you know, cause like classically, even, even people who aren't quote unquote fucking addicts, you know, if they're having a hard day, they go have a drink or, you know, like they dump something on top of that. Kind mm-hmm. of and, and that's the antithesis of the solution Mm -hmm. because like I said, the more you dump shit on it, the less you're going to learn how to process those fucking feelings. 
And so like having to sit through things sober and like really sit with those hard feelings, that's the fucking test of your metal. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Then to not go fucking grab a drink or not go fucking smoke a joint or not go shoot some fucking heroin into your neck or whatever it is that you do. Mm-hmm. That's the hard part. You know, it's just sitting in it and being like, okay, all right. And it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, that's the battle, man. That's mm. the battle is, you know, it's like they say in the, in the, in the 12 step programs, living life on life's terms. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Um, did I, did I tell you that, uh, the first night I was ever in San Francisco, I watched a dude just standing like a few paces off of the open street corner, shooting up into his temple. Oh, wow. His temple. Yeah. It just like, it was nothing. Huh. Do, have you heard of that before? Oh, yeah. I've watched people shoot up in their face. I watched this one chick shoot up in her forehead one time. It was traumatic. Damn. For both of us. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Damn. Yeah, I've seen some crazy shit, man. Um, I, You know, living that life, you see a lot of fucking crazy shit. You know, being in active heroin addiction, you, you deal with a lot of uh, less than stellar people. But, yeah. you know, I can't. I can't say anything about those people. You know, they're, they're suffering. Like they're suffering immensely, like more than, more than a little, you know, cause it, it takes a lot of suffering to end up living that kind of life. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, then that's just the nature of human existence. You know, suffering is the nature of existence. There's a lot of it and <laughs> yeah. we're not going to, we're not getting any less of it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, uh, we got the surplus on suffering. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> some would call it the prison planet. Yeah, well, some would be right. Mm-hmm. But, yeah. You know, and, <laughs> and what's what's even more fucked up is, you know, especially looking at it like that, like the prison planet, like let's, let's look at the prison culture. And not like like not like prison, prison, not brick and mortar prison, but the prison of your mind. Let's look at fucking societal programming and like the agreed upon realities that the religious, you know, fucking educational and governmental authorities have put into place to keep us in this agreed upon reality that they created. Yeah. <laughs> you know, let's talk about that fucking prison. I don't know where the revolution of the psyche is, man, because it, this is, um, this is the moment where it's most opportune. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's hardly anywhere to be found because in the same way that you can rage against the fucking machine and the patriarchy and everything else that's, that's oppressing everybody <laughs> that you can rage against yourself. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't rage against certain things out there because there is a time to revolt and stand up for yourself, but it's, it's, it truly is just as simple as taking the fucking plank out of your own eye as Christ himself would say, you know, right. and, uh, there's just, not enough people doing that, man. It doesn't seem to be. I mean, you don't even have to rage against the machine to just recognize that there is a fucking machine. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, you don't have to do anything brash. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, and that's like assuming, you know, I love talking about the patriarchy. That's a fun topic. <laughs> um, we'll probably avoid that, but <laughs> <laughs> there's definitely hierarchies. Yeah. Oh, yeah, certainly. And I think that hierarchies, um, you know, some people would argue that, um, they're unnatural, but what I say to that is regardless of anything outside of the human mind, I'll, I'll just set that aside in the conversation for a moment and say that, um, existentially, you know, in the, in the, the formation of our very thought process, there is a hierarchical structure and there fundamentally has to be because that's part of the aspects of discernment and, and right and wrong. I mean, there are other ways. You could describe it, but you can't deny that a hierarchical structure is very much a part, a necessary part of that description of that uh, unfoldment of consciousness. Right. And I don't understand how people can think otherwise personally. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree with that. And that's a good question. I don't yeah. see how they could think any otherwise. <laughs> Excuse me. Well, yeah, man. It's a, it's good to have you here in Florida. It's good to have somebody to sit and have intelligent, somewhat intelligent. I mean, we're idiots, but you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we fake it pretty well. Yeah, we shoot the shit. Yeah, it's it's, it's nice to have somebody to shoot the shit with. Yeah, on a, on a like real 
you know, real time, real world level about some like actually interesting fucking topics, man. Likewise, man. Thank you for having me. And we'll definitely be doing this more. Yeah. Pretty absolutely. often. Yeah. Yeah. yeah for Good sure. Stuff. Yeah. We got to get Martin involved, man. We got to get him down here sometime. Yeah. One of these we days got, we'll we got get Martin right here. Yeah. Here in the <laughs> studio. That'll be a hell of a time. You hear that Martin Ferretti? We're coming for you. Yo, did you know, um, shout out to, uh, Joe Roop over on, um, lighting the void. Um, he actually, he's in Florida now. Joe Roop is? Yeah. No, oh, where's he at? Um, I'm, I, I'm pretty sure he doesn't care. Uh, we can edit it out. I don't think he gives a shit, but he's out in Daytona area. Oh, cool. Yeah. So I think I actually saw that on his Facebook page. I recently just said, Oh yeah, I did see that too. Yeah. yeah. He's yeah. open about that, but yeah. yeah so we should, we could link up with him pretty soon too. That'd be fun, man. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, yeah. thanks. Yeah, man. It's, it's been super fun, dude. We're going to have to do this, uh, definitely more often. Yeah. Thanks again for having me and anybody listening, divemind.net. Um, you go check out Dive Manual and um, any podcasts and interviews that I've done. Um, and keep your eyes peeled for Hunt Manual. It's going to be all about demonology and Fortiana. Is there any uh, any like projected release date for that, or just it's coming? Um, it'll definitely be by the end of the year. Cool. Yeah. Sweet. So Sweet. we'll narrow that down more soon. Awesome. I'm looking forward to it, man. Likewise. All right. Take care, everybody. Thanks again to Anthony Tyler for being on the show. If you want to get in touch with him, you can find him at divemind.net. Once again, this has been the Dharma Junkie Podcast. I am your host, Justin Otto. And remember, it's not so much the destination as it is the journey. So keep on trucking. Namaste.